Oh, yeah, this is a good one. So um, I finally, finally got my hands on Larry's Garage, the um, the documentary focusing on Larry Levan. Larry Levan, Larry Levine, Larry Levan. Larry Levan's um, life and career at the Paradise Garage in New York. Um, a seminal disco and house nightclub that was what? I, I'm going to say opened in the late 80s. Yeah, right. Late 80s had a really short run. And unfortunately, um, Larry Levan as well ended up passing away fairly early in his life too due to various illnesses and complications with that and whatever it may be. But again, Paradise Garage, I'm sure most of you have heard of it, especially um, in recent years with the resurgence of interest. Mostly, I'm going to say, uh, due to the success of what um, Alex Olsen is doing at his brand, Bianca Chandon, he did a couple of T-shirts, I think, uh, for benefits of Larry Garage, uh, sorry, uh, Paradise Garage. He did a few other initiatives. Obviously, the music he plays is very much lends itself to that place. So you can see, you know, the, a lot of the influences of what Larry Levan did at, um, at Paradise Garage are definitely being felt even nowadays, right, in things that are going on. And I don't know, it was a very sobering um, documentary for me to watch, especially nowadays with the current conversation that's going around inclusion and discrimination and representation in nightclubs and in the dance community dance, well, the dance music scene and it was so cool to see um how much of a influence and a positive inspiration um larry levan was to so many different people when he's you know during his short time on this earth of course the documentary opens up with a few candid interviews with um, Larry Levan that I haven't necessarily seen on YouTube before. Um, loads of really cool um, sound bites from him talking about his ideas around nightclubbing, his ideas around providing a safe space, about music, about DJing culture, really loads of stuff that he said in the 80s that you can definitely um, relate to, the lessons that are kind of going on now in the scene. So that was quite cool to see. And again, very rare footage in that regard. And then as per the Maestro documentary, which I thought was the best one, but I definitely think this one is the best, best of the two. Larry's Garage um, they obviously went and interviewed a lot of the people that kind of played a big role in making Paradise Garage into what it was at the time and just people that kind of were loosely associated with that crew and it was so cool to hear about you know how much of a big role Paradise Garage played in cultivating the local community and the community worldwide right there's a bit about how big Larry Levan was in Tokyo I mean in Japan right regarding some of the music he was playing and of course you know they have some of the best fandom culture that exists in the world in Japan but to see how far reaching his influence was before the internet that we know as it is today was incredible to see um, to see how well regarded and revered he was to see of course the other bit as well that I didn't really wasn't familiar with uh, prior to watching the documentary was his how obsessed Larry was with sound in a nightclub he wanted the sound system at Paradise Garage to be the best sound system that ever existed and he kept going on and on about that there were some periods in, in the documentary where they were mentioning a little piece and pieces about um, Larry's you know uh DJing style and how sometimes he wouldn't necessarily always play the best set but he had the best selection but for the most part most of the stuff focused on the sound and the vibe and the overall feeling in a nightclub and it reminded me a lot of my time spent at Berghain my time spent at Robert Johnson my time spent at Sub Club and these kind of places right where you don't necessarily leave there with a recollection of who played and what they played you get more of a lasting memory of the ambiance the vibe the people right that you met in a smoking area the sound as you walked through as you kind of got past security that's what kind of you leave with and I think that's maybe a real good marker on the quality of a nightclub right if, I guess if a place has to rely solely on the lineup or on the, let's say, artistic direction of the flyer that some people have nowadays, mm -hmm. then you know you're not in a great place. And it's a shame, really. I think it's not necessarily anyone's fault. I just think, you know, dance music culture has um, exploded. DJing is, are now, you know, bigger celebrities than they've ever been. So this sort of reliance on making sure you build up names and hype names to sell tickets and to kind of get people through the door, because I've kind of, you know, I work briefly at a ticketing company and most of the time, most of the sort of, you know, um, outline, even though I did a terrible job at that place, absolutely shocking job. But most of the kind of brief that we were given 
at that place was essentially to keep put well you know you, you were kind of in charge of making sure you got all the necessary details that you needed about the festival or the event that was going on but most of the push in terms of marketing it was mostly around the names about the announcement of names who was playing remind them who was playing showing them clips of them playing somewhere else but all about the names less so about the promotion even though even less so about the promoters involved about the space the time of year even it was all about the djs all about their personalities behind the decks and i guess that takes away a lot from the actual things that make a nightclub what it is isn't it the people that are in it the sound the location the vibe like i said before and it was cool to see such a such importance being placed on that side of things by Larry during that time. And I think a lot of the stuff that I see kind of, you know, in documentaries about Studio 54, about Mud Club, about uh, what else can I mention? You know, these seminal locations where sort of like scenes and musical careers were sort of birthed. They sort of all kind of have the same sort of ingredients, right? This kind of, you know... Um, uh, reliance and concentration and sort of like you know real dedication to cultivating a community sometimes at the you know at the detriment of the people that are left out right this sort of like kind of really clicky feel really benefits it a uh, really strong concerted effort to make it the best place ever for a short period of time right because you know the Paris Garage had a really short stint but an influential stint Studio 54 short influential but then you know you look at the, you look at stuff that happens in Europe with Robert Johnson with Sub Club with of course with um, Bergheim of course which is a legendary one to keep mentioning I think they've sort of learned the lessons and the pitfalls of these places and kind of were able to avoid them because you know it's very rare you see clubs and establishments hang around as long as Bergheim has right and still be revered as they are very very rare but if you think about it <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with what happens behind the scenes the fact that they cultivate a community and a scene and a reverence behind the club with the people that actually play right so much so that people go out of their way to make sure that they're on their best behavior when they're playing at the Bergheim right legendary stories about flipping what's his name Richie Horton getting banned and chucked out of there for being a bit of a lad behind the decks they don't have any favoritism they treat everybody that comes through the door the same and they really make sure that they're really picky about who's allowed to um you know populate their dance floor and a lot of those sort of like codes a lot of those uh things that i see in those kind of places i definitely saw uh reflected in larry's in the larry's garage or paradise garage specifically larry's garage documentary and it made me think you know most of these things that we're seeing nowadays in clubland none of it's new all of it's the same and the other thing I kind of point out was your first so, oh the other thing as well that was kind of heartbreaking about the whole situation was of course Larry's untimely passing um due to maybe uh complications with um excessive drug use for the most part a lot of people were saying that he didn't necessarily he might not have had the monetary six the monetary wealth that would maybe you'd expect of somebody of his stature I think nowadays maybe that was maybe a consequence of the time that he grew up in but there was a real there was a real sort of like attitude hmm. there was a real kind of um i would say focus on artistry in the purest sense right in the 80s it feels like i don't know maybe um who was a good example they featured in the documentary what's his flipping name oh blah 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 that draw the sketch artist that draws illustrator that was around during um the paradise garage days keith herring keith herring might have been the first contemporary artist during that time who was the kind of contemporary version of what artists are now where they're sort of like half businessman half artist it feels like back then most of the people involved in the in the arts were artists first and foremost and businessmen second third or fourth so a lot of the things you heard from between the line between the lines were oh, that Larry was basically suffering a lot. His records always mysteriously got lost or misplaced, which in, in my opinion means that he was probably selling them to feed his habits or feed his addictions. And that's obviously disconcerting and really something that you don't really want to hear about somebody you look up to and revere that they were such in dire straits that they were having to sell their prized record collection to keep their fix. And then the other thing, of course, is this idea of getting lost in the source, isn't it? It's the iconic um you know gucci main quote where i think he actually was lost in the source himself during this time but i don't know specifically what it was but him mentioning you know don't get lost in the source right like don't stop thinking your suit don't stink or whatever it may be and it may be 
is a lesson that needs to be told. It's definitely something that needs to be reminded to people a lot more in the dance music scene, especially because you feel as if careers in the scene go up and down so quickly. People, you know, have a grand opening and a grand closing. Um, and most of the time when you kind of think about the person and you think, oh, where's he and she gone? I haven't seen him in a scene that long. It's usually as a consequence of getting lost in the source and not really concentrating on the things that matter, the things that got them to the dance. And that's the real shame of it. I think it would have been great to have had Larry's voice and vision um, still around uh, in club land, especially in America, because I think of how far back America has sort of like fallen in terms of dance music culture and influence, um, especially when you consider their rich heritage in nightclubs. It really is a crying shame. And you feel as if if somebody, you feel as if sometimes whenever scenes die or people pass away and things change, that the, the, the sort of vibe and atmosphere sort of leaves with them, unfortunately. It's very rarely that they sort of continue on you know, um, honoring the person's spirit and the place continues being the same. Naturally, people just fall off. Of course, most of it has to do with that sort of like four-year cycle thing that I think I'm going to get a book on soon um, that sort of describes, you know, the, the the usual cycle of scenes and subcultures and whatever it may be. It's usually around four years. So regardless if the person that's, that started it is around or not, there's going to come a time when things just need to get refreshed and people move away. They can lose interest, blah, 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 blah. Things can definitely change. But it was just nice to see all of um, Larry's old friends kind of gather around on his legacy and speak about how important um, Paradise Garage was them, was to them during that time. And it's a stark reminder for myself, of course, you know, being in lockdown at the moment and having no possibility of going to a nightclub anytime soon. Probably I'm going to say until the autumn of um 2022 i think as to when we're going to be able to go out again but i'd like to be reminded of just the importance of clubs play in terms of cultivating you know scenes cultivating communities cultivating relationships uh whether they be personal or business they are really a breeding ground for all those things and it's a shame that we don't have them around the moment but again um a great documentary larry's garage directed by corrado riza it's available on uh vimeo now at the moment to watch on demand so click the link available in the description below you can click that and rent it there directly definitely recommend you check it out if you are obsessed with dance music as i am again it's called larry's garage it's available now um it's the story of larry levine larry levant sorry i always go larry levine i'll just say larry levine the story of larry levant and the paradise garage definitely make sure you check it out i'll put the show in the description or sorry the link to the show the link to the documentary in the show's description so make sure you check that out if you've got a moment or two